Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comms. Today we're on a little hike, and this is kind of radio related. As we're going to go to the top, we're here at Max Patch. I'm here with Brian from FD Leatherworks, and we're going to check out an air navigational beacon. It's on a mountain a few miles over. It's the top right there. Surrounding scenery. And now we're at the summit of Max Patch Mountain. And you can see just how beautiful it is. There's not much better weather we could have asked for. And that direction right there, that's our vortex. Using Mission Manager, we can see here's Max Patch and here's the Snowbird Vortac. We're 5.37 miles distance between these two points, and the direction is 264 degrees west. And you can see that we're picking up our Vortac, and you can see the bearing is correct. Well, this is to answer the question really briefly on what you saw on the radio's display when we were listening to that Vortec and its transmission, which transmits all the time. And it's, we'll talk a little bit about a Vortec, but a VOR portion of a Vortec is transmitting all of the time. And this example is on 108.8 megahertz. So once the receiver starts to receive a signal you end up getting this course deviation indicator display on your radio and what happens is is your direction of travel indicator will be boxed into this circle and then your bearing in relation to the VOR will be displayed here and then you'll have your towards bearing if you're going towards it and your back azimuth are following if you were moving away from the vortex. This portion up here is kind of like a compass laid horizontal and this circle right here represents in this example here 265 degrees and the outer edges of this circle are the two degree mark and each tick you see here represents two degrees of the radials of the VOR, meaning that you've got a circle, you've got your VOR in the middle, and like the spokes of a wheel, you have your different radials, and that's represented by these tick marks here. This fat mark you see here moves back and forth, and this is indicating our direction of travel in relation to the VOR. And in this example, we're six degrees right of the VOR radial. What we can do is, is adjust course towards the left and that will box that indicator and that will let us know that we're proceeding towards the correct bearing of the VOR. There's a lot more to VOR navigation than just what I talked about here. You can vary the Omni bearing selector and therefore you're utilizing the VOR signal as a reference point. I'm not a pilot. There's a lot of other information on VOR navigation out there on YouTube. Enter it into your search engine and you can learn all about it. Our second test we performed was with our receiver at the peak of Lover's Leap which is just outside of Hot Springs, North Carolina. Back to our Snowbird Vortac here. And the distance is 14.8 miles, almost 15 miles, at a bearing of 243 degrees west-southwest. And here is our Vortac in question, as displayed on an aeronautical chart. You can see the location of our Vortac. 
the name of it, frequency, call sign, call sign in Morse code, and this circle that represents our radials. If we were headed towards our vortex, we would be on a bearing represented by T, and if we were going away from it, we would be on a radial represented by F. Some of you may be wondering what is a vortex? Well a vortex is essentially the co-location of two different types of air navigational beacons, one VHF and one UHF. The VHF operating in the civil aviation band and that is known as a VHF omnidirectional range beacon and then the military side of the house operating in UHF is called a TACAN, which is a Tactical Air Navigation Beacon. Our first example is the VOR, which is a transmit-only system, meaning it does not have a receiver built into the system. It identifies by Morse code periodically, and it operates in a VHF 108 to 118 megahertz range, and it's a fixed asset. The TACAN is a transmit and receive system. That means that the TACAN itself has a receiver as well as just a transmitter. And what that's used for is, is for the distance measuring functionality of the TACAN. The aircraft in question would send a pulse pair to the TACAN. The TACAN would respond back with a pulse pair and the differences in time from sending to receiving give you a very good estimation of just how far away you are from the TACAN station. The TACAN also periodically identifies in Morse code. It operates in the UHF range of 962 to 1213 megahertz in pre-established transmit and receive pairs. And again, it features DME functionality or distance measuring equipment functionality. And the more compact profile of a TAC can allows it to be mounted not only on the ground, but also in, on a ship or in an air-to-air -air role. I'm going to attempt to briefly explain how a Vortac is providing us with a bearing. This is a gross oversimplification of what's going on. I'm certainly not an expert on the subject, and it's hard to do the subject justice. It's really quite interesting how all of this works. But the signal we are receiving in this video is from a Doppler VOR. What we have here is just a discussion about what's going on. What you have is you have these horizontal VHF antennas that you see at the base of the Vortac that are on that ground plane. And each one of those antennas is transmitting 30 times per second and they're transmitting and it's rotating in a clockwise fashion. Now, once per revolution, we have a 30 hertz FM signal that's modulated from the vertical reference antenna on a 9.9 .9 hertz subcarrier. The way we determine what bearing it is is based upon that relationship and phase and amplitude and the differences of such. Again, that's very much the cliff notes example of what's going on here, and there is a lot of really good content out there on YouTube that explains this in much greater detail than I can provide here. If you choose to make a Vortac one of your monitoring targets, just consider the fact that it is engineered for coverage of the air and not the ground, and that reception range at ground level is going to be less than two miles. So you're going to be need to be in close proximity to an airport or to the facility itself in order to successfully receive the signal. The only reason we were able to receive it in Hot Springs, for example, although it wasn't line of sight away from us and there's a mountain between us, was based upon our elevation in relation to the elevation of the Vortac. I hope this helps. This is Brett from Survival Comms. Till next time.